order. Elliot Coburn to move the motion. Thank you, Dame Maria. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I beg to move that this House has considered human rights in Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka's 2009 conflict ended in a horrible, horrific bloodbath. Tens of, Tamils, tens of thousands of Tamils were killed in the final months, with accusations pointing to intentional targeting of civilians by the Sri Lankan military. This dark chapter remains open, with an estimated 70,000 to 170,000 Tamils unaccounted for and presumed dead. The government's continued denial of war crimes, crimes against humanity and even genocide fuels anger and blocks the path towards healing. And the situation for Tamils and indeed other minority groups such as Muslims in Sri Lanka remains precarious. Impunity reigns, human rights violations persist and heavy militarisation casts a long shadow. Sri Lanka's failure to address accountability and pursue transitional justice mechanisms hinder any hope for lasting peace and reconciliation. The international community's call for accountability haven't translated into concrete action. And the UN Human Rights Council rightly identifies the lack of accountability as the critical missing piece to Sri Lanka moving forward. We have seen decades of ineffective governance of policies driven by nationalism, which was a root cause of the conflict and continued to plague the nation, contributing to its current political and economic crises. And it is vital that the international community continues to hold Sri Lanka accountable for past and present human rights violations, because only through these effective mechanisms for international investigation and prosecution can Sri Lanka achieve meaningful justice and reconciliation and finally turn a page on this dark chapter. And Sri Lanka has witnessed a chilling escalation in the suppression of Tamil remembrance this past year. And as Tamils prepared to commemorate um, Mavinir Nal and um, Remembrance Day, and even during the ceremonies that took place themselves, police have actively disrupted these events, physically blocked people from attending, destroyed memorials with violence, and arrested participants. But this isn't a new tactic. Tamils in the Northeast have historically faced harassment leading up to this day. But th this past year, crackdowns intensified despite court orders permitting the commemorations. Fear and injustice has gripped the Tamil community following this memorial. And the notorious Prevention of Terrorism Act was once again wielded, leading to arrests of Tamils for simply carrying decorations or, att or attending remembrance ceremonies. And even those providing logistical support with vehicles or generators faced arbitrary detention. This draconian law, which is a stain on the country's human rights record, has fueled decades of abuse prolonged detentions, disappearances and torture, particularly against Tamils and Muslims, and they are the horrific realities of the PTA. So stronger action from the UK is crucial to abolish this act. Because the shadow of militarisation does loom over Sri Lanka's Tamil northeast population. Despite boasting one of, the world's larging, uh, one of the world's largest militaries, a staggering 18 of its 20 divisions occupies the northeast region, with 14 concentrated solely in the north. And this overwhelming presence comes at a steep cost. Sri Lanka spends more on its defence than it does on healthcare and education combined. Recent claims of de-escalation and demilitarisation have not occurred, so concrete action is needed. The UK must continue to push with its international partners for the demilitarisation of the North East, dismantling the intrusive presence and allowing Tamils to rebuild their lives free from the constant shadow of the military. Now, as Sri Lanka tackles its economic woes, the UK must acknowledge the lack of political will to protect Tamil livelihoods and urge an end to the land grabs of Tamil land. Frustration continues within Sri Lanka's Tamil community and overseas as well, where they've long demanded a lasting solution which tackles the root cause of conflict and yet years of empty promises of un and unmet aspirations from successive governments have only fueled these demands. In February 2023, Tamil protesters defied intimidation and surveillance to stage, to stage a four-day protest across the Northeast in a powerful rejection of the 75th anniversary of Independence Day. And this served to symbolically re, uh, reclaim Tamil homelands and issue a clear set of demands, including the end to military occupation, justice for Tamil genocide, and uncover the truth of those who were disappeared. Now, President Rickman Singer pledged to solve the ethnic crisis and held talks with Tamil parties, but these efforts have proven uh, to be fruitless. The Tamil community awaits concrete action, not empty words. 
The country is clinging to a troubling legacy. Those accused of war crimes against Tamils continue to enjoy protection, some even receiving pardons and diplomatic postings. This blatant disregard for accountability exposes the shortcomings in the justice system and underscores the current administration's tolerance for impunity. There is a clear lack of political will to deliver justice for Tamil victims, evident even in high-profile cases. The unresolved Trinco 5 killings, for example, highlighted by the UN Human Rights Council and during recent GSP Plus trade discussions, stand as a stark example. As the, UN, as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights aptly noted, not a single emblematic case has resulted in conviction. Sri Lanka's path forward hinges on genuine commitment to accountability, a path that they have yet to take. Oh, I will gladly give way. I very much support uh, what my honourable friend has been saying. Um, and I use as a consequence the fact that settling this and getting the right human rights uh, uh, for those Tamils that are suffer, and many have fled over here into many of our constituencies. But there's also a, another side to this. The, the, the need by the Sri Lankan government, therefore, as a result of not resolving this, to station so many army divisions and spend so much on the military. is one of the reasons why, in the Hambota port, port, that the Chinese are able to get a 99-year lease having their ships there, and that means, therefore, because they're bankrupt. And that, therefore, has a very big impact on the UK's wider uh, views about the uh, Far East. Mm. My right honourable friend is absolutely right, and there is an increasing concern about Chinese influence on the island, and something which I know um, my right honourable friend is incredibly pow uh, powerful on when he makes his intervention, so I do hope that the government has listened there. Now, Sri Lanka does have a long history of truth commissions, in fact, over 15 since independence, but yet none of them have delivered meaningful, meaningful justice or accountability. The proposed Truth and Reconciliation Committee seems destined to follow the same path. The Tamil community remains deep, deeply sceptical. They advocate for an independent international mechanism with the power to investigate and prosecute impartially. The government, however, appears to view the TRC as a way to escape international scrutiny at the UN Human Rights Council. Truth-telling is crucial for transitional justice, but it shouldn't come at the expense of, hold, uh, but it shouldn't come at the expense, uh, of holding perpetrators accountable. The Sri Lankan government's past failures to deliver on these promises raises serious concerns. A genuine TRC should prioritise justice for victims, not serve as a tool for escaping international pressure. Now, Sri Lanka's, Sri Lanka's commitment to the UN Human Rights Council process has crumbled. After failing to show meaningful progress on Resolution 30-1, they shockingly withdrew from in February 2020. Even the limited progress is now being reversed. <clears throat> and a recent UN report from September last year painted a bleak picture, and I quote, Sri Lanka suffers from continuing accountability deficit. From war crimes to recent human rights violations, corruption, abuse of power, the path to justice remains blocked. No government has established a judicial mechanism to deliver, on, uh, to deliver justice in the emblematic cases outlined by the human, UN Human Rights Council. And allowing Sri Lanka to continually renege on its international commitments weakens the credibility of the UNHRC and its member states, and the fight for accountability must not be abandoned. Sri Lanka's war crimes remain unpunished. Despite overwhelming evidence, no perpetrators have faced sanctions under the UK's No Majigsi Style Act. This inaction stands in stark contrast to Canada, who sanctioned the former President Rajapaksa for their war crime actions, and the US, which has sanctioned General Shivendra Silva, whose division still stands accused of horrific abuses. The UK must act. Holding war criminals accountable is essential for justice and a crucial step towards a more peaceful future. I believe that the UK's relationship with Sri Lanka does need critical review. Military cooperation must be suspended until Sri Lanka removes personnel implicated in human rights violations from its security forces. The UK, also, the UK should also refuse diplomatic um, access and diplomatic roles to anyone accused of such abuses. Trade deals and concessions require re-evaluation in, re in light of this failure to uphold human rights commitments, and sanctions are a potential tool to pressure reform. Furthermore, the UK should make all future bilateral and multilateral ties with Sri Lanka con on contingent on concrete progress. This progress must address reconciliation between ethnic and religious groups, and Sri Lanka should investigate and prosecute war crimes and human rights violations, 
return stolen land, resolve disappearances and reduce the military presence in former conflict zones. Ultimately, the island must demonstrate respect and uphold the rights and freedoms of all of its people, regardless of ethnicity or religion. Investigating and prosecuting human rights abuses is critical to achieving this. By linking its support to these vital changes, the UK can play a significant role in pushing Sri Lanka towards a more just and peaceful future. Sri Lanka's human rights record casts a long shadow, demanding a firm international response. And the UK, along with other nations, has a crucial role in holding the country accountable. Firstly, those accused of human rights crimes cannot escape unscathed. Targeted sanctions against officials can deliver a powerful message. Additionally, the principle of universal jurisdiction allows countries to pursue legal actions against perpetrators on their own soil, regardless of where the crimes were committed. The International Criminal Court offers another avenue for justice, where the UK can collaborate with civil society to submit communications to the ICC's prosecutor, urging a preliminary examination of potential crimes committed that fall under that court's jurisdiction. And furthermore, Sri Lanka's potential breaches of human rights treaties cannot be ignored. The ICJ can be a forum used to address these issues, specifically those of torture, enforced disappearance and racial discrimination. Trade concessions granted to Sri Lanka under the developing country's trading scheme should not be unconditional. The UK can leverage these benefits by making them contingent on demonstrable progress in three key areas. The military being, um, needs to be purged of those implicated in engaging in human rights abuses, the repeal of the Prevention of Terrorism Act, and those responsible for well-documented well human rights violations being brought to justice. By employing this approach, the UK and the international community can send a clear message that human rights violation, violations will not be tolerated, and that these actions can and will exert significant pressure to pushing Sri Lanka towards a future that respects the rights of all of its people, and particularly towards that of the Tamil people of, a choosing, of achieving that peace, justice, accountability, and truth that they have so long fought for. The question is that this House has considered human rights in Sri Lanka, and I call Jim Shannon. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I, yeah, threw me off there. I, I just expected that the Honourable Lady would, uh, would, would uh, uh, be in front of me, but I'm very pleased to be called uh, and to make a contribution. Uh, can I thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak at this, and can I first of all can thank, thank and congratulate the Honourable Member for Shulton in Wellington, as he often does in this House, whether it be in, this, in, the, in Westminster Hall or in the Chamber. Uh, speaks up for minorities, for human rights issues, and he does it regularly. We appreciate that, all, all his efforts on that behalf. I've spoken about the human rights in Sri Lanka before. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to come back and, and, and say that things haven't changed, but unfortunately, Madam Chair, they haven't. Uh, and I suppose that's why this debate is so important, and the Honourable Gentleman has very clearly outlined why, why it's important. Um, and, and I want to speak, if I can, about the, the freedom of religion or belief as encompassed within the, the definition of human rights uh, that are, indeed must be addressed in this debate. I'm very clear in my, in my, in my uh, uh, impression of it, Madam Chair, and that's to, that's to do with uh, when, you, when you take away human rights, you affect your religious belief. When you take away your religious belief, you affect your human rights. So the two of them are married together. You can never ignore them. Uh, so whenever you, you talk about one, you talk about the other. So I want to mention about that and, and some other issues as well. So the question for us today, uh, uh, dear Maria, is this. How can we address this? Or more reasonably, how can we be part of the process of securing human rights for our needy people. Uh, their history has been one that makes my heart sore, uh, dear Maria. It does for, I think, for any of us who, who have compassion and, and, and those who have had lost everything, uh, their dignity, uh, their possessions, uh, their human rights, uh, their freedom of religious belief, uh, and indeed all because of, of an autocratic regime uh, that spends more, as Honourable Gentlemen, spends more in defence than it does in, uh, in feeding their country. Uh, whether it be even health or education. So it does uh, uh, move me uh, to tears when I think about it. I believe that steps can be made through the progress of having reconciliation through accountability and justice. The acknowledgement and correction against religious minorities must be considered by our government and our minister. I'm pleased to see the minister in this place. I always am, because uh, I think the minister uh, clearly understands our feelings, uh, what we think, uh, and, and indeed I'm hoping uh, when it comes to replying, we will have some uh, assurance uh, in relation to, to those issues. Because uh, our government develops the foreign policies 
<coughs> also very pleased to see the Shadow Minister in our place uh, and the Shadow Minister for the Scots Nats as well. Um, he and I have been uh, uh, good friends in this house for many, many years. We speak on issues together. We we have done uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, ventures overseas to to visit some of those countries where where suppression of human rights and religious freedom are rampant. Uh, so he and I. Uh, although we have different um, outlooks in the Constitution, have the very same opinion, De Maria, on this issue of human rights uh, and, and, and our social conscience that we both have is one that is married together, uh, as indeed is our faith as well, uh, mm -hmm. which we, we hold very, 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 very strongly too. So, Lincoln government agencies unlawfully occupied property and religious sites of minority Tamil and Muslim communities. Additionally, in, just as an example again, De Maria, in September 2023, a judge resigned and fled the country after he received death threats for a ruling that he made against the Department of Archaeology, which had constructed a Buddhist monument on the site of a Hindu temple. Now, uh, uh, as chair of the APPG for Freedom of Religious Belief, and I very clearly, De Maria, speak out for those with Christian belief, those with other beliefs, and indeed those with no beliefs, because that's what I believe in in my heart. Uh, and, and, and where I come from. So whenever I see uh, that a Hindu temple is disrespected and that a Buddhist temple is built on it, that's against the human rights and the religious belief of, of those of a Hindu <coughs> faith in Sri Lanka. And that's all done because it's encouraged by a government who has little or no uh, concern or respect for any other religion. How do we address those issues? I'll, I'll hope they can outline that in, in, in a way, but the major issue is when it comes to aid, we should be using aid uh, as a method to change the opinion of, of uh, um, uh, the, the authorities in charge in, in Sri Lanka and make it uh, make a change. As acknowledged in this uh, uh, debate, uh, debate's brief, the Online Safety Act and indeed other proposed and enacted laws by Sri Lanka uh, severely limit civil liberties, and they quite clearly do. So, how are these laws impact, impacting upon freedom of religion or belief? The right to freedoms of, of expression and assembly are heavily intertwined with the fate of Ford. I, I mentioned that at the beginning because I, I, I can never get my, my, myself away from, from that definition of, of where we are and, and how I and many others in this chamber today and further afield see it. Uh, as such, we must ensure that our foreign policies, and that's where the minister comes into play and our government comes into play, encourage compliance with Article 18 of the UDHR and the ICCPR which was ratified by Sri Lanka in 1980. Ratified by them, but never actually, no action taken, you know. So the disappointment I have uh, is that Sri Lanka's uh, government's action against those um, in relation to Article 18 uh, have, have been disregarded in the totality. F for freedom of religious belief is also intricately linked with women and girls' rights. And I want to mention about that because some of the things that are happening in Sri Lanka are bestial. They are disgraceful. And, and I, I, will, I will mention the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act, the MMDA, which governs marriage in the Muslim community, contains numerous provisions that violate, violate the rights of women and girls, including by allowing child marriage without setting any minimum age. I, I, I don't know, uh, dear Maria, but when I, when, I, when I think of that, I get really angst about it. Because I look at, uh, at, at my grandchildren, uh, and, and, and if they were living in Sri Lanka, uh, they, they would be, they could be abused, they could be married at the age of 9 and 15, even though their bodies, quite clearly, or their, their emotions, are not in any way ready for anything that to happen. Now, how could I, as a father and a grandfather, um, not condemn very clearly what the Sri Lankan uh, 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 authorities are doing in relation to what they do against young women and, and, and especially against young girls? Um, the Act stipulates that only men can be judges in, in, the, in the Kazi family court, which makes it easier, as it always does, that only men can be judges, uh, and that men, uh, as if for men and for women, to obtain a divorce, and does not require a woman or a girl's consent to be recorded before the regis registration of her marriage. That's a uh, an absolute precondition. So, Minister, so when, whenever it comes to answering, ever ever mindful, Dame Maria, that the Minister isn't responsible for what's happening in Sri Lanka, I would ask the Minister, has there been any discussions uh, with the Sri Lankan authorities in relation to this specific issue to ensure that there will be no, no underage marriage whatsoever? 
And furthermore, uh, to, to follow on from that, the penal code permits uh, what would otherwise constitute statutory rape in cases of child marriage that are permitted under the M MMDA. <coughs> in, no, in no country in this world can the statutory rape of young girls who haven't reached puberty, who uh, can be abused by people uh, just because they've got the right to do it by the law of the land. So uh, and when it comes to the, to the uh, uh, MMDA, the Divorce Act, what are we doing as a government? What are we doing as a minister? What are we doing uh, as, as a people of conscience uh, to help those, those young, young ladies in, in, in Sri Lanka? The UK must take laws into account as well as helping develop aid strategies and distribution policies for Sri Lanka. Additionally, the UK must consider the position of refugees in Sri Lanka as well. There's lots of refugees. There, I think the Honourable Gentleman for Clare Shelton and Wellington referred to uh, maybe it was 14 divisions in, 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 in the north of Sri Lanka who are there primarily and objectively to, to uh, intimidate all of the, uh, of the Tamils and the local populations and local religions as well. I mean, I mean how can this uh, be, be nodded through uh, by, 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 or, or disregarded uh, by, by our own government or by our own people. Uh, several religious minorities in Sri Lanka, including Lake Maharaj, the Honourable Gentleman for Argyll and Butte. He and I were in, 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 in uh, Pakistan. Uh, we had an opportunity to, to see and meet the Ag on, on a regular basis. Uh, and, 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 and really, I have to make a, a plea for them. They fled persecution from Pakistan uh, and are still waiting resettlement in, in other countries. Again, Minister, I, I ask, I, I'm, I'm very conscious I'm asking a lot of questions, but, but I do it because I, I feel that they has, it must be on record. And also, I do feel very, very strongly that we need answers. The resettlement considerations, while they may not be in the realm of the UK authority, they, they, are there ways, and I ask these questions, are there ways that we could help Sri Lanka in developing policies, processes, to ensure that the refugee rights are protected? Can we work with Sri Lanka, for instance? Uh, and relevant communities and governments to help resell the refugees into third countries. Now, th that means that we may have a role, but, uh, uh, sorry, that we should have a role, but it also means that we, we, we would, would uh, Dame Maria, uh, work alongside other countries to make it happen. And, and finally, w w will the UK be able to take on such refugees as part of its UK resettlement scheme for the UNHCR refugees? This is a question we must ask ourselves. Aware that we cannot solve the world's problems by ourselves, we can't. But we can play a role in how we can make lives better by bringing them to our shores, but equally uh, helping them to resell elsewhere, uh, and, and, and that we have international obligations to fulfil. I, I, can, I uh, conclude with this, uh, uh, Dame Maria. Ever mindful that others have to speak as well, and I want to very much give them all a chance to, to contribute. I've spoken on human rights in Sri Lanka on many occasions. Because I, 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 the stories that I hear and that others hear in this house uh, do move me to do all that I can, dear Maria. The question for our government must be, have we been moved uh, as much to do all we can? And if not, will we begin this movement today? The right to live, to work and to hold your own beliefs are something that we take for granted in this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But we are tasked with the responsibility, uh, dear Maria, of speaking up for those who don't have those human, human rights or those uh, uh, freedom of religious rights in Sri Lanka. And we can, I believe, dear Maria, and we must speak for those who have no voices. And did our debate today, and my voice, uh, dear Maria, I'm today, along with others in this chamber, to be the voice for the voices, the voiceless of Sri Lanka that need us to, to speak up for them and do our best for them. Thank you so much. Siobhan McDonough. Thank you. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, Dame Maria. Um, I congratulate the Honourable Member for Carshalton and Wallington for securing this debate, and it is a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Strangford, who has so frequently found uh, spoken in support of the Tamil people. I hope, Dame Maria, that I am a friend of the Tamil community, a community that are hardworking, entrepreneurial, and have given so much to our country and our capital city, and who have an almost obsessive desire to educate their children to ensure that they are the future doctors, lawyers, engineers, um, and accountants that make such a contribution. Um, I'm well aware 
uh, of the tenacity of the Tamil community uh, uh, since the last 14 years since the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War. I have stood alongside Tamils in my constituency of Mitcham and Morden on the road to justice, peace and accountability. Those 14 years have presented so many challenges and such little progress, but so much pain. Not only have we co uh, called for accountability for the terrible war crimes committed 14 years ago, but we are calling for the end to the human rights abuses that are still being experienced by the Tamil community in Sri Lanka today. This starts with repealing the Sixth Amendment that continues to be a barrier to Tamil self-determination. The Sixth Amendment criminalises support in Sri Lanka uh, or abroad for the establishment of a separate state within the territory of Sri Lanka. Anyone who is convicted of violating the Sixth Amendment will face losing their passport and will not be able to sit for public exams or even qualify for a trade that requires a licence. It prevents Tamils at home and abroad from coming together to freely express their political aspirations. But it's not just the Sixth Amendment. We need to go further than that. The 13th Amendment stops elected members of provincial councils from using their powers and giving them instead to unelected governors controlled by the Sri Lankan president. That leaves Tamils powerless when the state takes ancient Tamil places of worship and converts them into Sinhala Buddhist temples. Tamils have nowhere to go. Back in the UK, I had hoped that at the last cabinet reshuffle, we might get a foreign secretary that would take some action on Sri Lankan human rights. A foreign secretary who was more than warm words for British Tamils calling for justice. And what did we get? We got Baron Cameron of Chipping Norton, who has spent his, spent his time out of office being paid by a Chinese state enterprise to promote a commercial port in Sri Lanka promoting a Rajapaksa-era mega-infrastructure project. Who are sitting in the House of Lords. Um, I make then, as a statement of fact, uh, Dame, uh, uh, Dame Maria, uh, that David Cameron worked on behalf of the Chinese state enterprise to promote a commercial point in Sri Lanka, promoting a Rajapaksa-era mega-infrastructure project. I don't believe that that was in the interest of the Tamil people in Sri Lanka, and I don't think it was in the interest of this country either. Uh, my Tamil constituents, frankly, deserve better. There seems to be an attitude in the Foreign Office that I have witnessed over um, Labour governments and Conservative governments where there is always a need for discussion, encouragement. There is nothing I have seen in Sri Lanka over the last years since the Civil War that has suggested that the, the Sri Lankan government will ever react to anything but force and determination rather than encouragement or negotiation. Hundreds of thousands of people have still not been found who disappeared during the Civil War and not one person has been prosecuted for committing a war crime. There are, no, there are more answers than there have ever, there are questions than there have ever been. It is just, it does on occasion seem to me, just ticking a box and some mealy-mouthed diplomacy. Tamils deserve a UK government that will take the lead in calling for Sri Lanka to repeal the Sixth Amendment, giving Tamils in Sri Lanka and abroad the ability to come together and call for the political solution they hope for. Then we would have a government with a principled position on Sri Lanka. Um, Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, De Maria, and it's a pleasure to see you in the chair for this afternoon's debate on human rights in Sri Lanka, and I too would like to thank the Honourable Member for Carsholton and Wallington for securing the debate and for the way that he opened it, and to thank the members for Strangford and Mitchman Modern for their excellent contributions. Honourable Members will be aware that this House and the issue of Sri Lankan human rights are well acquainted. We have discussed it often, but we have done so because it is important, it matters, not just to us and to the diaspora, but it should matter to all who care about human rights, international law 
justice and accountability. But we have to be realistic. We have debated and highlighted these issues for decades in this place, yet the situation in Sri Lanka remains largely unchanged. And unfortunately, I suspect the community will say that they've heard it all before, because even a glance at Hansard this morning, I found 1975, Russell Johnson, the Liberal MP for Inverness, urging the government to do more to end human rights abuses in Sri Lanka. 1984, Clyde Cymru's David Wigley, pleading with the government not to forcibly, forcibly repatriate Tamils to Sri Lanka, given the levels of sectarian violence. Or in 1985, the very young member for Islington North demanding an arms embargo on Sri Lanka due to their appalling human rights record. And exactly a decade later, the Honourable Member for East Ham asking those fleeing the regime's persecution be granted asylum in the UK. And even at the start of the new millennium, Erfin Lewis from Plaid Cymru urging the cancellation of arms export licences to Sri Lanka following verified reports of extrajudicial killings. And on and on it goes. Members of this House as recently as last December, quite rightly and properly, raised these hugely important issues of fundamental human rights in Sri Lanka. So if nothing else, we in this House have over many decades shown tenacity and resilience. And so we will appeal once again to the UK Government to use their position, to use their strength as a believer in the rule of law, to encourage the Sri Lankan Government to finally abide by its international obligations and to act in accordance with the accepted international standard of human rights. As we've heard so often in these debates, Sri Lanka is a founding member of the Commonwealth. And we know that the Commonwealth founding principles are peace and democracy. But by no stretch could Sri Lanka be considered to be a champion of those principles in the Tamil minority numbering just around 11% of the population, are still subject to human rights violations at the hands of their government. In their country report in 2022, the US State Department, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labour, said of Sri Lanka's human rights practices that they included credible reports of unlawful and arbitrary killings, torture, arbitrary arrest and detention, a lack of an independent judiciary, violence against journalists, serious restrictions on internet freedom, restrictions of the freedom of movement, serious government corruption, a lack of accountability for gender-based violence and crimes involving violence targeting members of national, racial and ethnic minority groups. The US State Department concluded that the Sri Lankan government took minimal steps to identify, investigate, prosecute and punish officials who had committed human rights abuses or who were engaged in corruption and saying there was impunity for both. By any standard, it's a damning report, but none of it, if we are honest, would have come to surprise, come to surprise any of us in this House who have watched Sri Lanka's treatment of the Tamil minority over the years. From the state's inception, the Tamil minority have been treated as outsiders in their own land. The Ceylon Citizenship Act of 1948 effectively rendered Tamils stateless, leading to the deportation of many thousands of Tamils to India between 1960 and the 1980s. That was quickly followed by the 1956 Sinhala Only Act, which made Sinhalese the only official language of Sri Lanka, completely excluding Tamil and making it abundantly clear that for Sri Lanka's Tamils, they, their history, their language and their culture had no place in that new country. And given that level of state-sponsored discrimination, it's little wonder that there has been such an appalling catalogue of violence and atrocity crime perpetrated on the Tamil people. Time and again, they have been the victim of oppression and systematic violence dating back to the 1950s. And it continues to the present day. Violence which includes very, very serious accusations of widespread sexual violence being perpetrated against women and girls, both by the Sri Lankan military and Sinhalese mobs during the numerous anti-Tamil pogroms that have stretched back for decades. Absolutely. Jim Shannon.
giving way. And, and he just reminded me there about, uh, in what he said that what we do need is, is uh, uh, along with the things that we're asking for, we do also need, uh, Dame Maria, uh, accountability for those who carried out some of those despicable and worst crimes. Because it's not, uh, to make sure that they don't think that they're getting away with it, that, there is a cri that the crimes yes. have been carried out, uh, that will be accountability in the courts of the land. And what I want to see, uh, I know Dame Maria and you and I probably, and many are, would say, they will get their justice in the next world, but I want to see them getting their justice in this world. Yeah. I, I thank my honourable friend for, for that yeah, intervention. Right. And he is right, and I'll touch on it momentarily, but it is absolutely essential that there is accountability and yeah, that yeah. people are held to account and that we use what powers we have yeah, yeah. to ensure that that happens. Because various UN bodies, Human Rights Watch and other human rights organisations have long criticised successive Sri Lankan administrations for failing to seriously investigate and prosecute those responsible for the most gravest of human rights abuses. Amnesty International has identified that despite mounting global pressure to, ask, uh, to, to act, these violators have gone scot-free. The, issue, the issues have remained unaddressed and groups pressurising the government to act have been harassed and have been marginalised. The Honourable Mentor, Member for Carl Shulton and, and Wallington talked about the 1979 Prevention of Terrorism <coughs> Act, and that's been a real area of grave concern for many of us. The Prevention of Terrorism Act has allowed arbitrary uh, arrests, detention without charge, false confession and torture of anyone suspected of terrorism. The government has used that act for 40 years to arrest and detain opponents and to suppress the Tamil community. More recently, it's been used to detain protesters and anyone who will speak against the government, even if those comments were made on social media. Now, however, there are real fears that its replacement, the anti-terrorism bill, may be actually worse and that the government's attitude towards minority groups has not changed one iota. The UN Office for the Commissioner for Human Rights has already stated that this new anti-terrorism bill doesn't go anywhere close to sorting out the defects in the Prevention of Terrorism Act, saying that it's deeply regrettable that the proposed legislation does not remedy any of the defects. And earlier this month, Human Rights Watch reported on the proposed new law, which they say will severely curtail civil liberties. New laws which include an online safety act, electronic media and broadcasting authority bill and a non-governmental organisation supervision and registration bill. These will grant broad powers to security forces and severely restrict the rights to freedom of assembly, association, expression, one which will impact not only the civic space but also the business environment. Dame Maria, Sri Lanka appears to be going backwards in terms of adherence to the principles that we hold dear of upholding and protecting fundamental human rights. And that, as the Honourable Member for Mitchum and Morden said, represents a collective failure by the international community. It says that we and our partners have not done nearly enough to pressurise the Sri Lankan government to change its behaviour. We have not thus far, I believe, used all options open to us. So isn't it time, Minister, that as well as us debating and discussing in this place and the FCDO persuading and pressurising in their place, that the UK actually flexes its muscles where it can and it applies targeted Magnitsky sanctions against those who can be identified as being active or complicit in human rights abuses. Other countries can do it. Other countries have done it. And I believe it is the very least that the victims of this war, both living and dead, both here and in Sri Lanka, could and should expect from us. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship. Uh, we've heard some really strong speeches today and interventions from members, not least uh, from the member for Carl Shelton and Wellington, and I congratulate him on bringing forward this De in really important debate. Uh, I thank the members who've contributed today, the member for Strangford 
outlining the importance of the freedom of religious beliefs, which is incredibly important, and the MP for Mitcham and Mordham, who spoke powerfully about the need to protect human rights in Sri Lanka, the need to protect the Tamil community. For the Labour Party, issues of human rights and international law will always be central to how we approach international affairs. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to speak on this topic today. My colleague, the Shadow Minister for Asia and Pacific, the member for Hornsey and Wood Green, is currently travelling on parliamentary business, so she has asked me to speak in her place. There are many close ties between the UK and Sri Lanka and many living links between communities in both countries. Sri Lanka is a member of the Commonwealth and has been through a challenging period of economic crisis in the last few years. It's also one of the FCDO's 32 human rights priority countries, quite rightly, which is clear recognition of the serious ongoing human rights concerns there, including those rights of minority groups. The Labour Party believes that a central component of the UK's approach to Sri Lanka must be to support human, th that support for human rights, for accountability, and importantly, for reconciliation. Sri Lanka's long civil war has left deep, deep scars on the people of that country. And in the final months of that war, thousands of civilians, mainly from the Tamil community, lost their lives. This period included its extensively documented reports of atrocities, of torture, and extrajudicial killings. So it is deeply, deeply troubling that 15 years since the end of that bloody conflict, so few people have been held accountable for their actions and just how little progress has been made. That search for justice remains elusive. And the reality is that the Sri, Lan Sri Lankan government has sought to evade accountability and delay scrutiny. It's important that we therefore call out this as being unacceptable and we will continue to do so. Many colleagues and honourable members from across the House will be aware of the strength of feeling of these issues among many in the diaspora communities of our country. Many people write to us with concerns about the ongoing lack of accountability for what happened during that terrible period. I know many colleagues across the House, many of whom who can't be here today, have received that correspondence. Justice and accountability are critical elements of building a durable and inclusive peace. That's why my colleague, the Shadow Minister for Asia and the Pacific, the member for Hornsey and Wood Green, welcomed the announcement made in May last year that the Sri Lankan government will be undertaking a National Unity and Reconciliation Commission. But there are many outstanding concerns. Several major non-governmental organisations, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have raised concerns about this commission. There appears to be a genuine lack of confidence in the milestones involved. Progress in transitional justice depends on the support of victims and their communities, and it needs to be properly resourced. It needs to be independent and it needs to be transparent. It needs to be a proper truth and reconciliation commission that gives confidence to the international community. Can the minister, therefore, in his response, outline this government's view on the commission and what progress has been made with it? With domestic processes of justice being so long delayed and denied, we must also look at alternative routes. And I want to mention two of those. The first is whether the UK government is willing to consider human rights sanctions against those deemed responsible for grave human rights abuses during the Civil War. I'm sure the minister might tell me he cannot commit, but can he acknowledge at least that key allies like the UK, of the UK, like the US and Canada, have already done this, including sanctions against General Silver. So what is stopping us do, doing the same? Can he answer that today? Second is about international routes to legal accountability. Can the minister make it clear whether he believes, based on the evidence at interna the International Criminal Court, 
that there is a case to be answered to prosecute international crimes committed during Sri Lanka's uh, civil war. Can he let us know if the UK government is supporting this process in any way? Tamil communities as well as as other minority communities continue to face harassment, land seizures and marginalisation, including against civil activists. Just last week, eight Tamil Hindu worshippers were arrested while engaging in festival rituals. They were detained for more than 10 days and allegedly su subject to abuse. So this only serves to sustain and deepen tensions and divides between the communities there. So can the minister outline what steps his government is taking through his, its funded programmes in Sri Lanka on human rights to address the long-standing issues facing minority communities, particularly the Tamils. We all want to see a pathway for Sri Lanka to become a pluralistic, multicultural democracy in which all people can flourish. But for the people in Sri Lanka and its di diaspora whose lives were destroyed by this terrible civil war, truth, accountability and reconcilia reconciliation are those essential stages on this journey. So I hope the Minister can give confidence to our constituents right across the country and those who care deeply about human rights that the UK government are doing their part to support justice and peace. Um, Dame uh, Maria, I believe this is the first time we have <coughs> joined in uh, such an endeavour during our time in the uh, House uh, together, and it is a huge privilege to uh, serve under uh, your chairmanship today. Um, I'm extremely grateful to my uh, honourable friend, the member for Carl Shelton and Wallington, uh, for securing this debate, and I congratulate him on the way in which he uh, presented what he had to say to us today. Uh, somewhat similarly to the uh, opposition spokesman, um, the, uh, I should say that I am standing in for the Minister for the Indo-Pacific, my right honourable friend, the member for Berwick-upon-Tweed, as she is unable to attend today. Um, but it is my pleasure to respond uh, on the behalf of the government to uh, the excellent and interesting debate which we have uh, just heard. Um, I'm extremely grateful for the contribution of all honourable members who have spoken uh, today. I will seek uh, to respond to all the points that have been raised, and if uh, I omit any of the points that have been raised, uh, I will, of course, immediately write to honourable members, if that's the case, straight uh, afterwards. Um, there is one point which I want to pick up at the outset, which was made by my honourable friend, um, and it is to do with the British military engagement in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, uh, but the rest of his points I hope to pick up during the course of my uh, remarks. Um, I want to tell him that the British strategy for defence engagement in Sri Lanka focuses primarily on professional military uh, education, strategic le leadership and international uh, development. And to say to him that we continuously monitor the context and viability of the approach to ensure that UK assistance is in line with our values, is consistent with our domestic and international human rights obligations, and assures the process of selecting appropriate personnel for any UK-sponsored uh, training. Um, the, I'm grateful uh, particularly to my honourable friend for uh, Strangford, uh, indeed, who was questioning me just uh, an hour or so ago on issues to do with uh, Hong Kong. Um, and I recognise the specific um, interest and experience he brings to a debate like this because of his ex knowledge and understanding of reconciliation and uh, conflict um, and healing. And uh, I uh, heard him say, and how right he is, that he speaks up always in this House for uh, human rights and indeed for the uh, voiceless. Uh, the Honourable Lady for Mitcham and Morden spoke movingly on behalf of her Tamil constituents, and I will seek to come to uh, at least some of the comments that she made uh, during her remarks. The Honourable Gentleman for uh, Guile and Butte uh, likewise raised important issues from his experience of these matters. 
and the Honourable Lady who today is speaking for the opposition in this matter uh, for Cardiff North raised a number of points which I will come to, but she asked me two specific questions. The first was about human rights uh, sanctions, and as I think she inferred from what uh, she said, uh, on all such matters, we certainly keep them under review as appropriate, but we do not discuss them in advance, and we would not uh, discuss our thinking either across uh, the, the floor of the House, and she'll not be particularly surprised to hear me say that. Uh, she also, um, secondarily, made the point about the importance of accountability, and I'll, I'll come to some of this in my uh, further remarks, but but I want to be very clear to her that we regard transparency and accountability as a fundamental part of reconciliation. And I will say a bit more about that um, in a moment. Um, Dame Maria, uh, if I turn to the current situation, human rights in Sri Lanka remains a priority for the government, and we monitor closely the situation there and uh, developments. The fact that Sri Lanka is a human rights priority country uh, for the British government reflects our concerns about a range of human rights uh, issues and uh, quite rightly, honourable members today have highlighted a number of those concerns. And civil society continues to face surveillance, intimidation and harassment by state authorities and those points were eloquently set out uh, during some of the contributions we have heard today. We're concerned about a trend towards a more constrained civic space. This includes the use of laws to limit freedoms of expression and assembly, such as the misuse of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the PTA, which was referred to earlier. Britain continues to call for the replacement of the draconian PTA with legislation that is consistent with Sri Lanka's international obligations and to uphold a moratorium on the use of the provisions of the PTA. We're also concerned about the Online Safety Act. Recently passed, it has the potential to restrict severely online communication and could potentially criminalise many forms of expressions. And Dame Maria, proposals to strengthen the regulation of NGOs and of broadcast media raises fears of efforts to restrict civic space. Yes, I will. I'm giving way. On the point about the online space, that is encroaching indeed internationally. In fact, here in the United Kingdom, the Tamil Guardian and other Tamil um, publications have faced uh, deplatforming from places like Meta, Facebook, Instagram, for example, from complaints made elsewhere in the world under the auspices of this PTA and other bits of legislation. So can he um, perhaps take away how we can protect the freedoms of Tamils to express themselves freely online when they are outside of the, geogra of the geographical space of the island? Yes, I will, I will certainly uh, take uh, that away as he requests. Um, and I hope that some of what I will have to say will assist in um, addressing that particular point. We want to encourage the Sri Lankan government to hold comprehensive consultations with stakeholders and enact amendments to align legislation with Sri Lanka's human rights obligations. Now, as this House acknowledged in a debate, I think in December, uh, Dame uh, Maria, a number of different communities, including Tamils and Muslims, face marginalisation by state authorities. There have been increasing tensions around land, which has sometimes centred around religious sites, such as the most recent incident at a Hindu temple in Vavuniya. These actions and incidents have troubling implications for freedom of religion or belief. There have been reports of state-sponsored settlement of traditional pasture land in Bati Kaloa, which threatens the livelihoods of local farmers. These events have increased the risk of communal tensions and stoked perceptions of forced displacement from traditional Tamil areas in the north and east of Sri Lanka. There have been several incidents, Dame Maria, of heavy-handed policing of peaceful protests and commemorations. And the ongoing special police operation, which is ostensibly aimed at combating drug trafficking, has raised serious concerns over arbitrary arrests, seizures of property and ill-treatment in detention. Now, if I turn to what Britain specifically is seeking uh, to do, and that is promoting human rights, reconciliation, 
and justice and accountability. These are key strands of the UK government's policy towards Sri Lanka. Now, my right honourable friend, the Minister of State for the Indo-Pacific, raises our concerns about the human rights situation in Sri Lanka on a regular basis. When she visited Sri Lanka in October, she raised concerns with the President, the Foreign Minister and the Justice Minister. She again saw the Sri Lankan Justice Minister while he was in Britain last week. And when in Sri Lanka, my right honourable friend uh, met the Governor of the Northern uh, Province, Tamil representatives and members of civil society. She raised the need for progress on human rights for all communities in Sri Lanka and the need for justice and accountability for violations and abuses committed during and following the armed conflict. The British government has an £11 million programme that supports human rights and reconciliation in Sri Lanka. We have specific projects and programmes that help tackle the legacy of the conflict, support civil society and democratic processes, promote gender equality and reduce inter-community tensions. And we have been a leading member, Dame Maria, of the core group of countries in the United Nations Human Rights Council who work to improve human rights, justice and accountability throughout Sri Lanka. And we have worked within the UN human rights system to raise concerns and build international support to strengthen human rights. We used our statement to the UN Human Rights Council on the 4th of March to raise our concern on recent legislative developments relating to human rights, reconciliation and civic space. Our statement urged the government of Sri Lanka to ensure meaningful consultation on the proposed Commission for Truth, Unity and Reconciliation. And Britain has stressed the importance, as I mentioned in my early remarks to the Honourable Lady, of transparency, accountability and inclusivity in any process and of building meaningfully on past work and recommendations that address the root causes of conflicts and impunity. The British delegation in the UN Human Rights Council led work on the most recent resolution on Sri Lanka. We remain ready to support Sri Lanka in addressing the UK uh, penned resolution 51-1. In the resolution, we focused international attention on the human rights situation and shortcomings. We succeeded in renewing the mandate of UN human rights experts to report on these issues and to preserve evidence of abuses and violations. It turns specifically to the point that the Honourable Lady made, committing during the armed conflict so that justice can be pursued. We call upon the government of Sri Lanka to engage constructively with all UN human rights initiatives and to take up the offers of the support available uh, to them. There are, De Maria, some positive signs. We welcome steps taken by the Sri Lankan government to address some of the community grievances and civil society and international community concerns. The release of some disputed lands is a helpful step, as is the release of some long-term PTA detainees. We welcome the government's initial steps to engage with representatives of the Tamil community on a long sought after political settlement. And we have urged the government to consider further confidence building measures and engagement. And we welcome steps taken by the government of Sri Lanka to improve connectivity between the North and countries in the region, including through regular flights. This should help increase economic opportunities for Tamils and others in these communities. Now, Demir, if I, Maria, if I may conclude on this note, Britain uh, monitors human rights developments in Sri Lanka closely. We welcome the ongoing attentions and contributions of honourable and right honourable members and the spotlight it brings to this issue. We are concerned by the ongoing land disputes, the continued harassment and surveillance of civil society and limitations on freedoms of expression assembly and association, including through recent and proposed legislation. We will continue to urge the Sri Lankan government to adhere to its human rights obligations and fulfil its commitments on transitional justice, legislative reform and taking steps to build trust in its institutions. Our projects 
and programmes in Sri Lanka will continue to target the drivers of conflict and support improvements in human rights. Ministers and officials will continue to engage with the government and wider society on human rights and transitional uh, justice. And we will remain, De Maria, a leading voice on the international stage, working with civil society and through the United Nations to deliver meaningful human rights improvements for the Tamils and all the people of Sri Lanka. Elliot Coburn to wind up. Thank you, Dame Maria. Can I thank the Minister for his response? And could I also thank all Honourable and Right Honourable Members for their contributions, particularly my um, Right Honourable Friend, the Member for Chingford and Woodford Green, the Member for Strangford, uh, and of course the Member for Mitchell Morden, and uh, congratulate her on her damehood. I've not had a chance to do that yet. Um, uh, we cannot allow the continued lack of progress to continue. Funnily enough, we, we will no doubt be back here again, uh, but no, uh, not least of which because our Tamil constituents will demand that of us. As the member for Mitchum and Morden said, uh, particularly here in London, we are lucky to be blessed with large Tamil populations. I represent many Tamils in my Kashal and Wannington constituency. They are uh, excellent community voices. They are very active in our community. They are very keen UK citizens. They are m active in our public services. I think something about one in 10 doctors, for example, are Tamil. Uh, it was a Tamil who was on the team of doctors that came up with that first uh, COVID vaccine at Oxford. So we thank the Tamil population for their contribution to us in the UK and recommit ourselves to doing all we can for them to secure that peace, justice and accountability. And the question is that this House has considered human rights in Sri Lanka. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Sitting is suspended until 4 p.m. 4 PM. And I just want to check.
Order 